If you carefully position the laryngoscope prior to the swallow, you can capture these events quite easily. The scope should be placed in the home position with the view of the endolarynx prior to the initiation of the swallow. This allows the clinician to clearly observe events of aspiration before and after the swallow when the objective lens of the laryngoscope is unobstructed. Given that events of aspiration can occur during the period of whiteout, it may be necessary to transiently advance the scope into the laryngeal vestibule following the swallow to scan the anterior trachea wall for the presence of aspirated food or liquid using the deep look technique that was described earlier in the presentation. Observing new subglottic food and liquid allows a clinician to confirm an event of aspiration during the swallow when the view may have been obliterated. All right, let's, let's view this video again. This is passage of the scope through the nasal cavity. We will advance the scope to the nasopharynx, angulate the tip down, and get a view of the larynx. And we'll just let this play through. All right, again, we've identified our path. We're advancing the scope back. We find our first landmark, and we observe a few swallows here. And as we advance towards the posterior wall, the tip of the scope is angulated down to view the hypopharynx. Let's take a look. We'll just back this up just a little bit here. And we can see now the scope isn't quite at 90 degrees. We're in the open space of the nasopharynx here. As we advance the scope further, it will hit the posterior nasopharyngeal wall and be guided down into the pharynx. Let's take a look at that. And there we are, positioned well now to look at swallow function. This is perhaps the most difficult pharyngeal stage finding to determine when employing laryngoscopy. The period of obliteration or whiteout will prevent direct viewing of penetration or aspiration. The laryngeal vestibule and subglottic shelf will sometimes hold clues as to the path of the bolus during the period of obliteration, and we saw this in some of our examples earlier. Occurrences of laryngeal penetration with resulting residue in the endolarynx during the swallow are fairly easy to identify after the epiglottis returns to rest and the larynx opens up for our visual inspection. Events of aspiration during the swallow are more problematic. Tracheal residue is fairly easy to visually locate if it's placed along the anterior wall of the trachea. However, the field of view of the endoscope will very rarely include the posterior wall of the trachea. The only evidence available that would point to an event of aspiration along the posterior trachea wall would be residual reflective material in the area of the interarytenoid space should no evidence present itself, but aspiration during the swallow is suspected, the clinician should position the scope and wait for coughing or clearing attempts. If these do occur, the clinician should scan the vestibule for evidence of dye in the sputum. If the patient is suspected of being a silent aspirator, the clinician can request the patient to cough and then monitor the sputum if produced for evidence of the dye. If all signs are negative, but aspiration is still suspected, repeat the presentation and look for these events again. Aspiration during the period of whiteout will not be directly observed as it occurs. Many individuals dismiss the entire procedure, often citing the single weakness as the reason. This would appear to be a dramatic flaw in the examination for those clinicians that require direct observation of events as they occur for proof that they occurred. It's been my experience that when the clinician employs deliberate endolaryngeal and tracheal inspection following each swallow and combines this with sensible inferential skills, sensitivity for this finding is strongly enhanced and often, but not always, resolute. One of the benefits of fees is that the patient could be observed to take food and liquid spontaneously and without the choreography of food presentation and swallowing imposed by the x-ray exposure. 
During a fees, the clinician does not have to instruct the patient to hold the bolus in their mouth until the x-ray image is acquired. And the patient doesn't have to suppress a swallow during the same time period. It's important to remember that many normal subjects, when not given a command to suppress a swallow, will advance the bolus into the distal pharynx prior to swallow initiation, as was demonstrated by Dr. Martin Harris's paper. And so we have a table of unresolved clinical conditions on the left and the instrumental exam that you may choose based on these unresolved clinical conditions. And we'll just go through them very briefly. The elements that we just discussed may influence a clinician to consider that endoscopy is not the appropriate instrument to use. And so fluoroscopy may be the first instrumental choice. If there's oral stage dysphagia, obviously this is not going to be viewed well via the laryngoscope, which will be placed behind the, the base of tongue or above the base of tongue without a view of the manipulation of the bolus or the movement of the bolus or the containment of the bolus or orally. If that's something you're very interested in viewing, you would of course perform fluoroscopy. If there are upper esophageal or esophageal problems that are suspected, endoscopy will not be able to view bolus transit through those areas. In my particular clinic, if a patient presents with vague complaints where I cannot determine easily or readily the source of their complaint, I will typically perform fluoroscopy. If this is an initial exam for long-standing dysphagia and I have an opportunity to schedule an exam in advance, I will schedule a fluoroscopy. This is just my clinical practice. If there's food stuck at the thyroid notch or lower, uh, we talked about suspicion for upper esophageal and esophageal dysphagia earlier in my clinic will receive a fluoroscopy. Now, there's some overlap here. If there's a sudden onset of pharyngeal dysphagia, food stuck above the thyroid notch, or a retest for pharyngeal dysphagia, each of these exams will serve well. If you're attempting biofeedback, again, very easy to show the image to the patient. I think the image of the larynx that's provided by the laryngoscope is intuitively understood to be the airway by patients and family. And so if there's a discussion that's necessary to convince someone that there is some element of peril in taking food or liquid, this is a very good instrument for demonstrating the transit of food or liquid into the airway. Many patients present with signs or symptoms of laryngeal penetration or aspiration before the swallow is initiated. And in these cases, we have great confidence that this will be visualized well with the endoscope in place. Again, if we have an open air space and the events are occurring within the open air space, the laryngoscope will provide an image of these events. And because the view of the larynx is so good with the laryngoscope, you have an excellent opportunity to look at airway closure and any compromise due to either neurologic deficits or structural deficits. And so the abnormal vocal quality is an important presenting factor when choosing the exam. If there are increased difficulties with swallowing over the duration of a meal related to fatigue, many, many patients suffer from fatigue during mealtime. Patients with progressive neurologic disease, such as Parkinson's disease, or perhaps lung disease, or COPD, may also fatigue during a meal, resulting in a reduction of caloric intake and associated spiraling weakness. And so, an advantage is given to the laryngoscopic exam in that there's no time constraints as there is in the fluoroscopic exam. Well, let's take a look at uh, just the fees image of a puree bolus being swallowed first in real time and then in slow motion so that you can get an impression of what a slower moving, more cohesive bolus may look like when advanced into the pharynx. And so we'll see some applesauce, a little bit of blue dye in the applesauce arrive into the molecular space. There's a bit of a pause. There's no additional travel down into the distal pharynx as we'd see with liquids at this point. And so filling the molecular space completely into the period of whiteout and then complete clearance of the bolus. The molecular space is completely filled 
And we see the swallow occur at the end of whiteout, perhaps just a very minuscule amount of secretions in a bit of the applesauce collecting, nothing to be concerned about at the close of this swallow.